to the Living Farms podcast, the place where we discuss biodynamic practices worldwide for you, your farm and the planet. So welcome to the Living Farms podcast. Today we are talking about communicating biodynamic research with Martin Quentin from the Biodynamic Research Association in France. Welcome, Martin. Good morning, Lynn. <laughs> so let's dive directly into the topic. You're in bi communicating biodynamic research. Could you elaborate a little bit how you came to biodynamics and what you're currently doing in your work? Yeah, sure. Well, this is a long story, but um, I trained um, as an agronomist in an uh, engineer school in, in France. And um, <clears throat> from, the, from the beginning, I've always been interested in into the knowledge of the living. I've always been impressed by the life of plants, animals, the beauty of landscape and so on. And I always have the feeling that when I learned the explanation given by, by materialistic science, something was missing, even if, you know, uh, the interaction between uh, atom and molecules and all the biology, the microbiology is fascinating. There is a gap between all this uh, materialistic knowledge and the concrete experience I can have by watching, being with a plant, being in a landscape, being in a, in a place. And I, I always had this feeling that there was a part of the knowledge that was missing through uh, this uh, mainstream science that I was learning in my university Uh, process and um, so at some point uh, I found uh, books and uh, literature about uh, first Goethean science and phenomenology uh, and that led me to to study and to discover Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy and this uh, this claim uh, Rudolf Steiner was uh, uh, claiming that there is a scientific way a possible way to have to gain knowledge on living system on the reality that doesn't necessarily uh, pass it through uh, materialistic uh, experiments and that through a proper uh, training of the senses of the thinking of the all the, the, the tools the human being have we could gain knowledge on on reality and to me that was really an interesting way and i keep following actually in that way and then i discovered biodynamic farming and all the um, all the project that were carried by by people around the world i study after my master degree in agronomy i studied um biodynamics anthroposophy and Goethean science in california in us in the us for two years and And there, from there, I started to to work with the biodynamic organization in France uh, when I came back, and with this intention of working with, on the one hand, training and uh, training people, farmers, gardeners, and people interesting in in a broader approach to nature, and also this uh, topic and this uh, question of bridging um materialistic science with uh i mean i'm not a, a defensor uh, uh, of spiritual science or anthroposophy but i take it seriously as a as a way we should really explore and i believe that the the outcomes the, the techniques the, the model the practices of biodynamic farming for instance as a whole is actually provides really relevant um, solutions for the challenge we face today. And when I see biodynamic farms, the examples they show, what they do in the real life, to me, it's really uh, something to follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and then you started with research communication out of this inner um, path and, and way. And, What are you currently doing with the Biodynamic Research Association? Like, what kind of projects are you involved in? And what is currently happening there? Yes. Um, 
so the when I when I look at the also in the media and um, I I realize that uh, biodynamic farming is really not well understood um, and especially by uh, scientists uh, in the academic world um, and uh, and when we hear there is no research there is uh, there is nothing based on on science uh, in in biodynamic farming. And um, I, I've always been surprised by this uh, uh, this statement because, uh, of course, uh, bio, biodynamic farming techniques don't come from uh, materialistic experimentation. They they come from um, intuition and inspiration and a, a general worldview uh, that provide insights and that then uh, came down to concrete practices such as the, the, the biodynamic preparations or the, 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 the work with the farm the farming organism. Um, but what today's science can do is actually study what are the results of biodynamic farming, what biodynamic farming uh, provide and make to soil, what biodynamic farming uh, makes to plants, to their health, to their capacity to, to evolve, to resist to, um, to sickness, to their capacity to, to produce quality food. Um, all this science can assess. And actually, actually they, uh, we begin to have uh, very interesting studies on, on these topics, and we'll talk about it uh, most likely later. And another thing science can study is um, uh, through sociological and anthropological science, how the people who carry out biodynamic farming, how they engage in their work, how they came to it, how they relate to their land, to their plants and animals, how they are in relation to it, how they care for it. Um, all this uh, actually uh, is very... We found a specific position and attitude in uh, the biodynamic movement, and it, it can be studied and with uh, with the general tools of science. Um, so there are actually not a lot, but uh, already kind of uh, an interesting body of literature available on uh, biodynamic farming. And to me, it is very interesting to when we want to talk seriously about biodynamic farming and not just discard it as witchcraft or uh, pseudoscience, we should really take this into account. So most of my work since maybe four or five, year, five years is about um, making a re review of all the, the, the scientific works available in all the different fields, from history to sociology, anthropology, biology, soil biology, agronomy, physiology. Um, we actually have very interesting works uh, from different universities, different researchers around the world. Um, and, uh, and most of the time when we hear about biodynamic farming, we don't hear this. This, um, these works. So, yeah, my my point is to to make this work visible and available also in the French language, because in, in France, I also realized that even within the biodynamic movement, people were not aware of the what's available. So, yeah, there's, there's already, in a way, we can say there's a lot to, uh, to deal with, and in another way, uh, it's very few and it's very difficult to draw strong conclusions out of the, the scattered uh, literature available. So, but the, the interesting point is that it's growing and it's every year we have more and more researchers working on studying some aspects of biodynamic farming and we have more and more paper published in academic journals, which which is good. The, the biodynamic farming is now uh, recognized as a relevant field of study. Uh, and, uh, yeah. 
And you just mentioned that this number is growing, which I also perceive this way. And I mean, the numbers show it that that more biodynamic research is existing. And do you have the feeling that this is um, particular in certain regions that research is doing and that more biodynamic research is done or or is it really all over the world or are there certain specific fields where where more research is published? Yeah, well, each country has its uh, history about uh, about the relationship with uh, biodynamic farmers. Of course, the, the, the original and the, the first uh, work we had were more mostly in uh, German-speaking country. We had the, the Fiber Institute for Organic Research in Switzerland that uh, published a lot of papers and had the long-term experiments, the, the so-called DOC trials, who studies the, the conventional, the organic and the biodynamic systems uh, as a whole. So it's a system comparison uh, for now more than uh, 30 years, even 45 years, uh, the, the, the oldest experiments. So they have really uh, relevant data uh, on the comparing uh, organic, biodynamic, and conventional systems. So this is really interesting. And they it's, they keep going on these experiments. It's uh, very interesting. There's a lot of publication to read about it. Um, they mostly uh, talk about the, the role of uh, the place of animals and animal manure in the maintaining soil fertility, soil carbon um, in and, and organic matter in the soil. And uh, they, they saw that uh, if you have a certain amount of uh, animal per hectare, let's say uh, 1.4 uh, cattle unit uh, per hectare, uh, which is what is commonly uh, present on biodynamic farm, uh, you, you have a better uh, fertility management over long over the time than if you have less uh, cattle unit per hectare uh, meaning half of it uh, 0 0.7 uh, it's it's much uh, much less interesting in terms of fertility so as biodynamic farming promotes the place of uh, animal and in this idea of the farm organism they show that this is a relevant idea for making sustainable systems um, but they do not assess directly the effect of, let's say, horn manure preparation or silica preparation in their uh, in their trials. So this is the kind of historical trial. And now we, and in Germany, they also have uh, studied biodynamic for years. Um, and now here in France, it's quite new that uh, the research, the Agriculture Research Institute, uh, start to to engage and to consider biodynamic farming as a valid uh, field of study. But they they have to do it because now, especially in the wine uh, sector, we have an important uh, contribution of uh, biodynamic farmers. They represent, uh, on the whole vineyard in France, it's, I had the, check the, the numbers, it's, 2% of the whole, the general vineyard surface in France. And in some region, it's up to 6%. Here in Alsace, um, we have almost 6% of biodynamic farmers, which is a lot. So mm -hmm. research cannot just ignore these people because they are not all uh, doing witchcraft, you know, and they have good results and their wines are expressing uh something different than the other ones and um, so in france through the increase of the especially in the wine sector research is coming in and and researchers have uh, amazing surprise you know when they look at the soils for instance and uh, they compare there is a study ongoing uh, comparing soils, uh, the microbiology of soil, especially through the 
the study of uh, bacteria and fungi and all the population and how they interact, all the microorganisms within the soil, uh, they saw that um, it's an ongoing study. It's not published uh, yet, but they saw that the, the biodynamic fields, they had way much more um, life, microbiological uh, life, um, even compared to organic farming and, of course, to, to conventional. And the, the links, the interaction between the, the organisms, which means the functionality of the whole microbiome, is much more uh, active in, in fields treated in, uh, with biodynamic methods. And they, they did this on a very uh, important uh, number of, uh, of field studies. So they have really robust, statically robust uh, results. So, and people are surprised. They don't know how, which parameters make this, but when they compare as a whole, we see, okay, uh, biodynamic farming is uh, making soils better. Uh, and another uh, study uh, looks at the, the health of plants through the, also through genetic uh, markers and identification. They look at uh, how the plant is able to, uh, to, to manage and to activate some genes that uh, are uh, that resist that are genes of resistance to stress and to uh, to fungal attacks, and they realize that biodynamic wines have a much better response uh, to climatic and pathogen uh, stress than uh, organic and conventional wines. So this is really interesting. For now, it's just a, it's just a fact. When we look at how plants behave, we see a difference. When we look at how soil behave, we see it's definitely uh, something's happening that we don't see in organic farming. So, and the interesting thing is that it's also through very uh, biotechnological methodology, metagenomics, uh, DNA sequencing, and all this very wide. Uh, methodology that we manage to have uh, very relevant differences. Sometimes if we look just at uh, the usual uh, biophysical components, it's not so easy to distinguish between organic and biodynamic. But when we go into this really precise uh, genomic uh, sequencing methods, methodology, we have really uh, relevant results. Um, yeah, I, I found it so interesting when we, um, as a section for agriculture, when we organized the biodynamic research um, conference in 2021, um, we saw that there are more and more people doing research, as you said, on the different fields, on the different aspects of biodynamics and um, in various countries. And it's it's amazing to see that this kind of research that you're just mentioning, this precise research, which is really looking at details and really looking at the depth of biodynamics um, is progressing. I, I just love that. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's great to see. And Yeah, uh, and I'm not surprised it comes from the, the French, uh, French side because they, we, we have the history of Cartesian and uh, materialistic thinking, which is really strong. And of course, scientists first need to have facts at the, the biological and physiological and genetic uh, level uh, before maybe uh, studying other aspects. But in the other way, what I'm saying is, is not so uh, one-sided because we also have in France a culture of uh, social science, which is quite uh, strong. It's also the, the country where you know, Emile Durkheim, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the people who founded sociological science uh, works, also uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss, and now more recently we had uh, Philippe Descola, Bruno Latour, and these people uh, saying that, uh, yeah, we have to consider the relevancy of different worldview and how a worldview can affect uh, the the technique and the, the and even the science 
and uh, the, the, the technology that we make. And uh, th that there is not just one worldview that is valid and that produce uh, actionable uh, knowledge. There are actually a diversity of, um, uh, of worldview uh, that we can um, rely on to produce valid knowledge for the practical life. And uh, this is also shown by, uh, by recent studies in sociology and anthropology that if we look at the, the, because something we hear also is that, you know, biodynamic farmers, they are just following blindly uh, the, the advice of uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner's and they, they, they do not sing by themselves, they do not experiment. But actually, when you look at who is actually really doing the biodynamic farming, you see a real diversity of biography of people, of um of backgrounds and uh, these people they they are not just uh, uh, following blindly Rudolf Steiner's advice they experiment a lot which is the, the maybe the, the basic uh, attitude in science you know you you make trials you 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 try different things and um, so it's it's been really uh, shown that the biodynamic community which is not really a community because there are many people from different fields that interacts with also a lot of others communities they are not closed uh, on themselves uh, and they they bring together a lot of different uh, um, uh, knowledge system and uh, different levels of knowledge in order to make a kind of uh, synthesis which is uh, which is really rich yeah, in the sense and it's it's amazing that you that you share the experience I also have on biodynamics farms because they are often so curious. Like I know a lot of biodynamic farmers that started biodynamic farming out of the curiosity if the preparations really work or not, and they wanted just to test it. And then they found themselves in a lot of farm experiments they were doing. And yeah. why do you still think that? communicating the biodynamic research results is or i perceive it sometimes so much as challenging because it's it's um in the media often the case that as you said like the the biodynamic research is basically um not existing in the mind of the conventional media or something like this so they they often have like they don't know about the research results they don't know um sometimes about what is happening on the farms and still their opinions are so strong um why, yeah. why do you think that is <laughs> well but it's difficult you know science is very complex and uh and it's not easy to communicate about any kind of scientific experiment or results to uh, an audience or a wider public that is not somehow deeply involved in these questions because there is many way you, you cannot just take uh, scientific results as it is you have to consider the whole methodology it uses um, and, uh, and especially it's not easy to communicate when you are in a field that is uh, where you have so little study available so as I said earlier, it's it's difficult to draw conclusions from one trial. So you cannot draw conclusions from one or even two or three trials. You need much more data and uh, repetitions to have strong conclusions. So when you when you have not all these uh, data available, it makes the communication uh, and the dissemination of information much uh, more delicate uh, and and subtle. Uh, because you have to say, well, in this uh, context, in this field, we we tried this and we had this result, but it doesn't mean that in other, in another context it will behave the same way. Um, so, so yeah, this is this is challenging, and uh, of course, the way one study just take one focus or one point of view and. Uh, when you want to to consider the whole body of knowledge, which would be the the, 
the attitude, for instance, for a journalist or someone who make a, a documentary uh, or wants to have a, a position or an idea on, of biodynamic farming, then it's a, it's a huge work. And it's a huge work because it comes from a, a marginal uh, or revolutionary point of view, which really requires a step aside to um, to understand it, to open to when you're not uh, used to it. So I believe, you know, people that are really interested, they would find the information, but then... Um, we also meet um, many people in the public that are they have already their opinion and they are not actually interested in in science, uh, which is made also of contradictions and uh, which is a path of explorations of uh, the living process. Yeah. So what I hear is that on the one hand, it needs more research about biodynamic farms. And on the other hand, which I, which is why I value the work you're doing so much is to translate the research so that people understand it and that also people who are not involved highly in science and, um, and understand what different methodologies exist, understand what is currently, what are currently the results of the research existing and for me this raises also the question if we look at how could we develop biodynamic research further and the communication about the research like how do we maybe also need to redesign research um, for biodynamic farming because i found it's quite a different concept of farming as you said which is very holistic and this is sometimes difficult to grasp in this more traditional agriculture research, which is just focused on one factor. So how would you say could a research design look like for biodynamic research or other things that you need to consider when you study biodynamics? Yeah, what, what we can hope is that uh, through biodynamics, uh, who's studying what biodynamics farmers do and what kind of results they achieve or they claim to achieve, we build new methodology and new designs. Uh, and hopefully we we find new properties of the living or of the of the reality through the actions. Meaning uh, if really biodynamic farmers uh, have something make something relevant, then they should uh, be able to make the research evolve and discover what they are doing. And if not, in the end, uh, farmers should realize that uh, they are, they don't, they mistake, you know, they are not in, uh, on, on the right way. But I, I believe that the, the meeting and the encounter of <coughs> farmers and researchers will lead to a change of both of the sides. You know, research and science will evolve because there is at least some truth and some uh, innovation and uh, some insight uh, from the, the biodynamic farmers and the biodynamic movement. And in the other way, science will help and provide the biodynamic farmers uh, also insights to to be better in what they do and maybe realize the bias and the the, the wrong uh, direction they are taking because we we are it's not black and white you know it's not just like uh, uh, biodynamic farmers are everything to to teach to the scientists and they have to 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 discover all the the, the process they're working with it's a, it's a dialogue and uh, so but yes. I really believe that uh, biodynamic farming will, and it's not only biodynamic farming, because there is also, to me, it's important to widen a little bit a movement that biodynamic farming crystallizes, but that is much wider in uh, Western countries, and of course in uh, other countries too, of people having uh, a certain implementing a worldview 
uh, a spiritualistic and a holistic worldview into practice. So, uh, but as biodynamic farming is formalized, standardized, uh, it's easy to take as an example of this uh, kind of worldview. But I hope they will help science to, to consider uh, better study and consider holistic systems and um, also different parameters of quality because biodynamic farming, the aim, the, one of the, the main aim is to produce food of quality food, vitality, uh, food with vitality, and that on this side we could uh, find better methodology also to assess what is uh, a good product, a good food product, and and there are uh, ways uh, and innovation in in science process in in this direction. Maybe we can mention uh, the, the copper crystallization and all kind of morphogenetic. Um, methodologies which try to assess the the living properties of a product through uh, a reaction with uh, and the, the, uh, of a physical element that for instance crystallizes as the, the copper chloride crystallizes crystallizes in a, in form um, that that expresses the life process of of the product so yeah we can hope this a mutual uh, enrichment of science and uh, biodynamic farming. From from your perspective, what would be next steps to um, strengthen the biodynamic research globally? Yeah, there's many direction we can uh, we can work on. Uh, one. One that we try to do in France and that you do also at the Section for Agriculture is to to foster and to develop networking and the, the meeting uh, of researchers. But maybe they don't need us, really. Uh, they, what I see in France is it's, that it's also happened by itself. Uh, uh, but uh, it's it's important that the different people working on biodynamic farming know each other and how create a community of research where uh, and can help each other in designing experiments and uh, building research questions. Um, this is important. Uh, and at least know the work of each other so that we don't do they don't do several times the, the same studies in the same time and two different places. <laughs> um, so building network is once is is one thing. and uh, then there is also a part of the work that belong to farmers or farm organization that they go to to ask scientists to work on their questions uh, because they have many questions and they have uh, propositions of uh, of solutions or uh, techniques they want to experiment to respond to let's say climatic uh, disruptions, uh, better stress, uh, hydric, water, stress, and all these uh, these questions. So, um, yeah, farmers and farmers organizations should also um, tackle some somehow the, the scientific institution saying, well, can we work together on, on these questions? This is important too. Yeah, and then, you know, there's a lot. Uh, I see that science uh, also just respond to what's out there in the field. So if biodynamic farming unfolds and develops, then the science will will follow with uh, a step after. It's always a step behind, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Often in agricultural research, the, the practice comes first and then the scientists come and... And then we, we research what, what is going on and um, try to find different explanations or answers to the questions. Yeah, totally right. And Mata, at the end of each podcast, I always ask my guests, like, what are their personal three main reasons to continue oh. 
um, to work in biodynamic in biodynamics and to do the the work that you're currently doing. So, um, what are your top three <laughs> main reasons to continue the work? Yeah, well, thank you for these questions because it's uh, of course this enthusiasm to work for something is maybe the most important thing and. Um, to me, uh, what biodynamics brings uh, among other impulses is this, uh, it helps to develop a, a wider systemic and holistic thinking. And it's really missing today. Uh, most of the actions uh, undertaken uh, at different levels of the society comes out of a really narrow short-term and uh, reduction is thinking and i believe that uh, the, the world view and uh, the methodology and the, and the basics concept of biodynamic farming really help to develop a much wider uh, view taking into account not only productivity yields and uh, uh, economical factors but also the, the wealth of an ecosystem the and the role of the human being and the place and the happiness of the human being and this is really important in biodynamic farms that farms are not only uh, places of production they are also places of uh, being where we unfold uh, ourselves together with other living beings that are also unfolding themselves and if we can uh, develop this attention and this awareness of the life into into this, these ecosystems, into these farms, organisms, into these landscapes. Uh, actually, this is really important because it is out of this awareness that we are living into a living systems that is uh, that is not just providing us services and food for ourselves, but that is that also has its own. Uh, reason to to be in life well out of this awareness we can uh, really change our way of uh, behaving and making choices so to me biodynamic farming offers uh, an opportunity to to reconsider to consider widely our attitude towards nature so may, and maybe this is the second uh, the second thing to rebuild the relationship, a living relationship with nature, is really important. Um, also for autonomy, you know, because we are used to uh, let uh, the, the knowledge, not the knowledge, the the choice of and the responsibility for our actions to maybe to an, an outside knowledge, to a scientific knowledge that we know that is, it is, uh, tomorrow it will be, it will not be the truth anymore. Uh, so if we can base our actions and our, uh, our choices on something that is more autonomous, that comes more from our own experience of reality, um, to me, it's really important because we, we need this autonomy of thinking and of actions um, to really uh, unfold and grow as human beings. And uh, yeah, and then the third thing is it's connected to the others, but it's also the the importance of creating and of restoring the balance of ecosystems uh, and uh, in the countryside, in the farm, the agroecosystems, because we have so much destroyed it through standardization and uh, and the use of uh, chemical fertilization and treatments and pesticides and so on, that we really need to to change this. And and BD is biodynamics is one uh, component of uh, sustainable production and to me it's uh, biodynamic farming is really the biotechnology of the future mm. yeah oh, that's great yeah. yeah i i always love those reasons of the people <laughs> joining the podcast because they're so diverse and they are so 
um, for me, really heartwarming and maybe also for the listeners to, to hear why, why you, you, people like you keep up the work you're doing. And um, for those listeners, I will link the work you're doing. So the, okay. Thank the you. website. And in French? In, in French, yeah. So um, the people can learn French if they are not fluent yet. And um, as you mentioned in the section, we are also doing a similar work like you for translating it to different languages. And I will also link the doc trial and the research conference that happened in 2021. Thank you very much. Marta, thank you for, for joining this podcast and um, for enlightening us about the research communication work you're doing. Thank you. <laughs>